We're going to come to to God's Word. Um, Our reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, and I'm going to read the first 14 verses of Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored for you in heaven and about which you already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Father, as we look at your word, I pray that you will open our hearts to hear what you want to say to us and help us, Lord, to glorify you more and more in our lives. Amen. Age 17, I was introduced to Christianity through a friend who invited me to go to a youth club first and then to church. And over a few weeks, I heard for the first time in my life what God had done for me through Jesus Christ. I'd never heard the gospel before, but that was presented to me. And I understood quite quickly that I needed to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But I also knew this couldn't be done lightly. And I remember pausing on this journey before becoming a Christian and thinking, if this is true, It demands everything of me. I can't play at this. It was at a baptismal service on the 16th of March, 1986. On hearing the testimonies of those who were being baptised at the service, there were four people being baptised, including a rough and ready bouncer with arms heavily tattooed, sharing his testimony of finding Jesus, that I knew that I couldn't resist any longer. Towards the end of the service, a call was made. This is how it was done, I think, at that time. I think we sang, Jesus, I come to thee. And those who wanted to accept Jesus came forward. And there was no stopping me. I was going forward. I I knew that's what I needed to do. And forward I went. And they they took us. There was a group of us who come forward. They took us into a room at the back. And a dear man called John Saunders sat down with me to check that I understood what it was that I'd done in receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, what this meant. I can't remember precisely what he said, but he explained something to the effect that to be a Christian meant living with Jesus as Lord of my life, which would mean perhaps changing certain areas and giving certain things up and doing things differently. I remember thinking as he was telling me this that I I understand that. I already get that. That this demands everything of me. For Jesus to be Lord means absolute commitment. And that night when I got home, with the encouragement of the person who'd given me a lift to church, I told my parents that I'd become a Christian. And and it was good because actually that was quite costly because I knew that they would hold me to account. They would expect something different from me. And then the next day when I went to school, I told close friends that I'd become a Christian. And again, I nailed my colors to the mass. I understood right from the point of conversion that being a Christian meant putting Jesus first. To quote the words of 19th century missionary C.T. Studd, if Christ be God and died for me, 
then no, no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Either Christ is Lord of all, or Christ is not Lord at all. And we begin a new series today, working our way through the book of Colossians. And the book of Colossians is a book that emphasizes the need for us to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The first two verses tell us who wrote it and who it was written to. Let me read these two verses again. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae. I, I looked up, sometimes I look up, there are great things on, on the internet, aren't there? I looked at how do you pronounce Colossae, and, and I looked at four of the most popular sites, and they all pronounce Colossae differently. I'm not quite sure how we pronounce it. I'm going with what is written in the Greek text, but I don't know if that's the proper name. But it's, um, say, as long as you say something confidently uh, with biblical names, you generally are okay. It says, To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. So we're told there it was written by Paul, the apostle, along with his companion Timothy, and it was written to the church at Colossae, which is a town in the Lycus Valley in modern-day Turkey. We'll discover as we read that the church at Colossae was not one of the churches that Paul himself planted. In fact, I don't think Paul had visited there before he wrote this letter. It was planted by a local man called Epaphras, who's mentioned in our reading in verse 7, and he's also mentioned again in the last chapter of the book, in chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Epaphras, it's thought, was probably converted during Paul's three-year ministry at Ephesus. You've heard of the book, Ephesus is where the Ephesians lived. So that's where that book comes from. Ephesus was 100 miles away uh, from a Colossae. Uh, and, uh, and Epaphras would have been there. He would have heard the gospel. Um, Ephesus was a bigger city, a more important city. And he became a Christian. And it seems that he then took the message that he heard from Paul back to Colossae and the neighboring towns. And he shared with them what, what he'd heard, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And he formed churches in Colossae and in the neighboring towns of Hierapolis and, uh, and Laodicea. And Paul writes this letter whilst in prison, probably towards the end of his life, whilst he was under house arrest in prison at, in Rome. And it appears that Epaphras had come to visit him and spent time with him to live there and shared concerns about what was going on in the church at Colossae. It's not 100% clear what the precise nature of these concerns are. And as we read through the letter, we'll, we'll be able to see some of the, the types of things that were, were going on. But it seems that they had taught uh, lots of other things. Alongside the good news of Jesus, that there were people there who were teaching that you had to do certain things. You had to live a certain way. You, you had to have these ascetic practices. It, don't do this. Don't touch that. Don't handle that. Don't eat this thing. They added lots of other rules to the Christian message. And Paul writes this letter in response to what he hears is the situation. And Paul writes about the necessity and the sufficiency of Christ. The necessity, Christ is necessary for salvation. We need him. We cannot be saved without him. And the sufficiency of Christ, Christ is sufficient for salvation. We don't need to add in any extra rules or regulations, or rituals, or philosophies, he alone saves us. We simply receive him as Lord and live our lives to please him. Now, let me just say at this point, there is a difference, I think, between living, uh, if you like, out your faith as a set of rules and living in a dynamic relationship with the Lord. Sometimes our, our faith can, can resort to rules that, that we've actually, we just go through patterns. We come to church because we, we ought to go to church. We read our Bible because we've been told we read our Bible. We pray because we've been told we pray. We, we don't do this and we don't do that because we've been told. And we're living by a set of rules. Whereas actually what we're to do is we're to live with a, a relationship with the Lord. We're to seek to please him in our lives day by day. And we might end up doing the same things. We come to church because we want to please him, and we know church is a good place to actually encourage others in their faith and, and help to do things together. We, we pray because we want to please him, because we know that's right before him. But it's a different thing. We're not following rules. 
We're actually doing it because of our relationship with the Lord. It's out of gratitude. It's out of love for him. And I just wonder today, may, may just throw this question. I wonder if you've fallen to a rule-based faith where you're following rules rather than actually having that dynamic relationship with the Lord. That's what he wants for us, is to have a relationship with him, not simply to follow a set of rules. In our remaining time, I, I want to focus on the last two verses of our reading this morning. This is verses 13 and 14. Let me read these again. It says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Most of us, even if you don't like football, probably heard that Cristiano Ronaldo, the world's most followed person, he has over a hun- half a billion followers on social media. That is more than Kylie Jenner, can you believe it? Was given a free transfer from Manchester United to his new club, Al Nassar, in Saudi Arabia. Of course, he went for the new challenges and opportunities it would give him, and not at all for the $117 million annual salary. Should his old manager, Eric Ten Hag, phone him up tomorrow and say to him, Cristiano, good to speak to you again. I'd like you to play on Wednesday, and I want you to play a free role in the away game at Crystal Palace. I'd like you to drop a little deep, and then the team will play the ball through you as we attack. I suspect Ronaldo would say something like this. Well, thank you for calling me, Eric. It's good to speak to you again. But I no longer play for you. I'm no longer under your directions. I've got a new boss and a new team. Don't you know I've been transferred? He no longer belongs to Manchester United. If you are a Christian, you no longer belong to the dominion of darkness. You have been transferred. You have come into Jesus' kingdom, and you now have a new boss. That's what it's saying in these last two verses. And let me say four things about what it says here in these verses. Firstly, it deliberately recalls the idea of the exodus. The exodus is one of the defining moments in the history of God's people, going back in the Old Testament, where God rescues his people from slavery in Egypt. In Colossae, we know that many Jews lived And so we know that there were likely to be many Jews within the church, that they would have understood this imagery that was being used. 250 years earlier, Antiochus the Great had transferred or transported around 2,000 Jews from Babylon, who were in exile there, to Colossae. And the word that is used in the ancient text for, for moving these peoples around is the word that is used in our text that Paul uses here. It's not translated very well in the NIV. The NIV simply puts that they were brought into. But actually other versions, and I think they're better, they use this word. They were transferred into the kingdom of the son he loves. Because what Paul is doing is he's saying that you have been set free, like the Exodus. They would have understood this language, that you have been moved from one area to another, like people groups are. But your movement isn't into further slavery. Your movement is into freedom. It's another exodus, another salvation, another deliverance and rescue. And note that he says this is something that has already happened. It is past tense that he uses. It's not something that is going to happen in the future. If we're a Christian today, we have been transferred. We have been moved. We already are in the kingdom of the Son he loves. We're not waiting for this one day. We're in this kingdom. We have moved out of the dominion of darkness. And that phrase conveys an idea of restriction and limitation and a lack of freedom. C.S. Lewis graphically conveys the idea of dominion of darkness in his Narnia stories by depicting that, that area, that domain, as winter, but never Christmas. Always winter, but never Christmas. So we come into God's kingdom having been in a dominion of darkness. And that's where we are today. We are in the kingdom of the Son he loves. We have been transferred. 
And then he, he goes on and says about us being redeemed. He uses this word redemption in verse 14. I'm going to read the verses again for us. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. People still use pawnbrokers. There's one on Cowley Road in Oxford where you can secure a loan and get some money by handing over something valuable that you earn. It might be a bit of jewellery or a watch. And you hand that over, and then at a later date, you can redeem it. You can buy it back, and you have to pay a, a sum of money, more than you actually got in the first place. Otherwise, the pawnbrokers would go out of business. But you redeem it. You buy it back. That's the sort of idea behind this word, redemption. It, it is about releasing something that, that it needs a price to be paid in order for that to happen. And we're told in the Bible that that happened as Jesus died on the cross. We were redeemed. He paid the price. He did what was necessary to, to win us back. Another idea where this idea of redemption was used was in slavery. And, and you could free a, or redeem a slave by paying a ransom, a sum of money for them. And then they could go free. And what Paul wants to do in using this word is, is talk about the freedom we now have in, in Christ. We are now in, the, in God's kingdom, the kingdom of the son he loves, and we are now free compared to the slavery we were under previously. And the sort of things that, uh, that we were enslaved to, all sorts of bad habits that were there in our lives and wrong thoughts and patterns of behavior, uh, of, of being greedy or jealous or envious or or being addicted to pornography, or lust, or misogyny, or, or racist, or bullying. All those things that, that might be patterns, or have been patterns. We are now free from those things. And we are to live in our freedom. We have been redeemed. Another area, and this is one that I think is directly here. Some of us have done things in the past where, where we feel dreadfully guilty about. We've made mistakes, big mistakes. And we carry a guilt around with us. And yet we are free from that in Jesus. We are free. It can be like a shackle on us, yet we are free. We are free from the guilt of the things we've done wrong. Jesus has set us free. In his kingdom, the chains are broken, and we are no longer bound to keep repeating the same mistakes or keep doing these bad habits. We now can walk in the freedom Jesus has won. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I wanted to illustrate this. I, I wonder if one person would just come forward for me, because I wanted just to show you this by an illustration. We've got a volunteer who would come and help me. Kwame, you're a star. Thank you. So Kwame, Go on, if I put that over, if you hold that there. OK. And let me lock that. There, finally. So if you hold on to it, Kwame. So, so we are bound, we are constrained by the things that, that are part of being the kingdom of, of darkness, the dominion of darkness. And we have these chains around us, these patterns that, that hold us. And what Jesus has done is he's come along and through his death on the cross and his resurrection, he's unlocked the chains our difficulty is that it takes a while for us to take these chains off. And we can keep walking with these chains on for many years sometimes. We can carry these chains, even though there's no reason for us to because of what Jesus has done. They still stay on us, and we still hold on to these things. And what Jesus wants for us is that we will be released from all these chains. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you very much. I want to read a story. Diana, Diane Comp, who was a pediatric oncologist, tells a story of Arthur, who developed cancer when he was three years old. He had multiple relapses over a five-year period and was often close to death. 
His parents are wonderful, she says, patient with his treatment, never losing hope. One day, Arthur's mother called the doctor to ask something that had been weighing her down for years. She said that in the early years of her marriage, she had an affair and left her husband for another man. She became pregnant by him. And when he learned of her pregnancy, he gave her something to swallow in hopes of inducing an abortion. It didn't work, and he abandoned her. She returned to her husband, pregnant with Arthur. She asked for and received his forgiveness. He knew the truth, but always loved and treated Arthur as his own son. But her question to the oncologist was this. Do you think the concoction I drank to abort the pregnancy caused the, caused the cancer? Dr. Comp wisely responded that we will never know what caused the cancer. But doctors cannot heal guilt, and the mother suffered for many years with a terrible burden. Deep within her soul, she must have felt that a sin caused all this suffering for her son. Arthur's mother later wrote to the doctor, saying that she had grown up in a church that preached forgiveness through Christ's sacrifice. And in spite of this religious tradition, and this is her words, she said, she'd never been able to forgive herself and had rejected the forgiveness that God had offered in Jesus. There was no one in her church with whom she could share her burden. And then she said, when she finally forgave herself, she underlined every passage in the Bible that referred to God's forgiveness and was amazed that the burden was finally lifted. The healing of memories and guilt can sometimes be more difficult than healing cancer, she said. It's a, a powerful story. The story ends happily. That the, the boy who had cancer, Arthur, he actually they pioneered a new treatment and he recovered with that treatment. But, but the point is we can lock ourselves into all sorts of things of guilt and Jesus wants to take, he wants us, he's taken, unlock those chains, he wants us to take those chains off. Whether it's guilt of things in the past or whether it's, it's the ongoing habits that are not honoring to him. He wants us to walk in his freedom and in his redemption. And then let me just say fourthly and finally in, in this talk this morning. So we, we were in a dominion of darkness. We have now moved to the kingdom of the son he loves. But there's a question about the lordship of Christ, one which commentators Walsh and Kiermark raise. And what they say is, are we simply transferring from one place where we have no freedom to another place where we're merely subjects. Is that what the kingdom of, of Jesus is about? Is it simply we have to obey and actually we're in a totalitarian regime just like we were before? We had no choice before and we have no choice here. I have to say for some Christians, the idea of Jesus being Lord might, might seem no different to that. It does feel sometimes the way it's presented that actually you have to do what Jesus says. And, and it seems no different than a... Uh, an oppressive regime that, that you have to follow. And yet it is fundamentally different. It's not simply that we have a master who is more benevolent and kind. It's actually we have a freedom now in our relationship with the Lord. I do say, I, I, some of the songs we sing sometimes, I, I feel a overly... Um, try, well, the way, the way we look at Jesus' victory and what Jesus has done... I think sometimes we, we think Jesus is going to overpower people. And we pray that sometimes, don't we? We pray God's presence will overpower people and almost use violence to bring people into his kingdom. I struggle sometimes with songs. Uh, let me quote one, The Lion and the Lamb, where it says, Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. That's biblical. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Now, it's not wrong in itself, and it says in the Bible, every knee will bow before him. But, but are they going to be crushed into submission? The difficulty is that that's not what happened with Jesus on the cross. What we find is a victory is won, not through God enforcing people and, and overpowering people and using violence. What we, we find on the cross is that through the weakness of the cross, Jesus wins the victory. It seems to me that through the revelation and the realization and the purity of the purity and the love and the holiness of Jesus Christ, everyone will come to realize who this Jesus is, whom we crucified. That's where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Andrew Lincoln sums it up brilliantly. He says, The powers of evil 
are defeated not by some overwhelming display of divine power, but by the weakness of Christ's death. In the light of Jesus' resurrection, the death of the victim, who has absorbed the destructive forces of the powers, becomes precisely the point at which their domination is decisively brought to an end. Their claims, their accusations, their oppressive and divisive influence have all been subverted by a very different power, the power of the victim on the cross. As uh, as N.T. Wright puts it, the cross was not the defeat of Christ at the hands of the powers. It was the defeat of the powers at the hands, yes, the bleeding hands of Christ. And we're going to read, in, uh, as we go through the series, these verses. This is Colossians 2, 14 and 15, where it says, He, ch- he cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The cross is a place of victory. And it is through the cross, it is through the weakness of Christ that he overcomes all evils. And God isn't going to force people into his kingdom, but people are going to come to realize who God is and his purity and his love and what they have rejected when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. We've been transferred to a kingdom of love where we are won over by the love of Christ. And out of our knowledge and our experience of his love for us, we are now motivated that we want him to be our Lord. We want to do what pleases him. We want to honor him. We want to to worship him in our lives because he has done so much for us. And that is why we serve him as Lord, not because he's an oppressive power who makes us his subjects and forces us to do so. We want to freely love him as he has loved us And we know he's loved us through the cross. May God help us to serve Jesus as Lord. And may he help us to walk in the freedom that he has won for us. May we experience that freedom. And maybe today, some of us, God is actually saying to us, he wants us to take off some of those chains that we're still carrying. They're unlocked. And yet we still carry them 